our own personal access to the events in our own minds is very limited and very poor. Uh, we get an edited and metaphoricalized version of what's going on in our brain. So let's talk a bit about consciousness. Um, it's a subject that many of us find fascinating and, and others um, think is, is sort of impossible to, to explain. Uh, why do you think that uh, so many people um, think that it's, it's just intractable and we can't study it? I like to say it's, it's like somebody trying to explain um, how a smartphone works by just looking at the screen and pressing it and having no idea about how that relates to what's going on under the hood, inside, in, inside the, the phone. There's layers and layers and layers of activity going on there, and you'd never ever figure it out by uh, just playing around with the user interface. Well, what consciousness is, is basically the brain's user interface for itself. Uh, it's the level of uh, simplification that is most useful in the control of a human body. And in fact, uh, I've recently been putting it even more strongly and saying, actually, uh, my consciousness is the way it is because it's your user interface to my mind. If you want to know about my mind, ask me. I'll, I can talk to you about it. I can describe in, in uh, irresistibly metaphorical terms, I can't describe it in any other terms, uh, what's going on in my, in my head. And it's a very useful level of description. It's the personal level. I can tell you what I'm thinking about, what sensations I'm having, what, what reminds me of what. Uh, but all of that is uh, a fractional edited summary of everything that's going on in my brain that's permitting me to say those things to you. Mm -hmm. In the same way that what you see on the screen and hear in the sound effects on your, on your smartphone is just a very carefully edited and distorted account of what's going on inside the box. So. Uh, uh, the reason it's so puzzling is that people think that they ought to be able to study it from the inside, doing sort of pure phenomenology. And those give you hints, very important hints. But they're, first of all, they are in some important regards illusory. That's not what's really going on. It so seems you... like there's a as I put it, there's a theater that you're, you're watching everything on a screen. No, that's just not true. It's not what's going on. Uh, and and uh, people really don't want to believe that their knowledge of their own thinking is as impoverished as it is. So how do we look behind the screen then and uh, get at what's really going on there? Well, the same way we do for any, uh, say, biological science. If you want to know what's going on in your stomach, you, you get out your microscopes and your fMRIs and your, and your CAT scans and you do a proper job of figuring out how the parts work and how they intermesh, what they're made of and all the rest. And that's it. It's neuroscience. That's what you do. And there's lots of experiments that you can do. In fact, the last 20 years has been just, uh, just a flood of interesting research. And it uh, is clarifying gradually, in some cases very dramatically, what actually happens you know, between, your, you might say, between your eyeball and your tongue <laughs> uh, when you look out at the world and tell people what you see. What have we learned from, um, from brain scanning studies and, and that kind of research that could uh, start to unpick the, the, the mechanisms of consciousness? We've learned less from the brain scanning data, which we're now drowning in. We've got plenty of data. Uh, what we need now is theories. What we need is models. And uh, the, I think perhaps the main virtue 
of having all the brain scanning data is that now, finally, cognitive science is looking at the brain. And for several decades, it was considered uh, premature to look at the brain. You know, we'll, we'll work this out. Uh, it's a little bit like software engineers saying, don't worry me about the hardware. I've got a software problem I'm trying to solve. Uh, and it, it, that's the way cognitive science was, oh, for several decades. Uh, people doing models with scant attention to how those would be realized in the brain in the same way that software engineers can do vast schemes of software before they even worry about how to get actually down to the executable code, let alone what's, what's happening uh, <laughs> in the individual registers. Uh, they, they leave that to the, to the hardware people. Well, now we've seen that we have to look at the hardware and at questions of location in the hardware. Nobody, nobody in, in computer science knows where in the metal box <laughs> a particular thing is happening. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's happening, and sometimes it's happening wherever the CPU is, but uh, it's not very informative. And the, whereas in the brain, a brain is a kind of computer, but it's very different from a digital computer. And if we're going to get the understanding we're striving for, we're going to have to learn to think about how 86 billion individual, slightly different neurons, no two alike, how they can coordinate to, uh, to make a mind, to do the computational work of a mind. And there's still a lot of uh, theoretical uh, advances that have to come before we get a good grip on that. Is there in your mind a theory at the moment that um, that kind of stands out as, as the most plausible uh, explanation? I think there's, yes, I think that the global neuronal workspace models, of which there are several, and um, uh, Bernie Bars is the one who started it, uh, and then um, uh, Stand On and, and Change in Paris, and their, and their colleagues have developed it in a number of ways, and it's pretty close to what I was saying in Consciousness Explained, but with more detail. And uh, that, that family of models is beginning to look more and more promising, and new phenomena are being provoked <laughs> uh, by exploiting the model, and that's always a good sign when you can get the brain to do something you've never seen the brain do before. And the reason you got it to do that was because your model says it should be able to do that. Uh, so that's, that's good. We're making progress. So I, think, I think that's the most promising uh, direction. So this is the idea that when there are certain um, uh, units in the brain all talking together at the same time or, or broadcasting uh, <coughs> some information to another part of the brain, that there's that's what, uh, what creates them. Well, it's, it's that there's a, uh, uh, a sort of arena of intercommunication. And what's still largely in the dark is one of the most important issues of all, and that is communication signaling isn't just sending spikes from A to B. The thing, B has to be able to make use of the spikes that it gets from A. And uh, whether the information is being transmitted at all, usable information is, uh, is not demonstrated by, by the fMRI picture. Yes, you know that when this lights up, this lights up. Okay, and you know that, so this is communicating with that, but what, what does this understand about what this is communicating? And the very use of the word understanding is, is a little bit of poetic license because uh, what you really have to do is understand that these are signals between brain parts that are sent by senders that don't really understand what the signals mean and are received and 
responded to by receivers that don't really know what the signals mean. And yet, because of the way they're coordinated, you, you get a comprehension, you get high-level cognition as a result. And do, do, these, um, do these models, or uh, do these theories kind of um, uh, come out of looking at the difference between an awake brain and, and a sleep brain, or, or different kinds of modes of consciousness? Is, is that kind of the way that we will get towards uh, understanding what consciousness is? I think the difference between being awake and being asleep is um, pretty well understood at the basic sort of neurophysiological level. And I don't think that there's a whole lot of more exploring there that's going to really pay off. You know, the, the sort of uh, experimental work, which we're going to have to figure out how to do, and we now have some wonderful new tools for doing it, um, is uh, analogous to how you catch a spy. Uh, you know, there's a you know there's a, a leak from the Pentagon, and it's uh, you don't know who's who's doing the leaking. Well, one way to do it is to put a little bit of false information in the Pentagon in various places, and uh, different bits in different places, and see what turns up on the espionage market in <laughs> you know in Beirut or Geneva or wherever, and. You don't know how it got from A to B, but you know it did, because you put in a you put in a you put a sort of marker on that information, and you can then trace the effect. And so, it's very important in this kind of research that you be able to do delicate causal interventions without doing brain surgery, and we're just developing the tools for that now. Uh, the optogenetics and uh, 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 other non-invasive ways of putting signal into very localized parts of the brain or shutting down temporarily very local parts of the brain without, you know, without using a scalpel. And that is going to uh, revolutionize our capacity to understand how the pieces work. Do you think um, using drugs to change how the mind works is a, a fruitful avenue for understanding how we get consciousness? Oh, I think it is. Um, and it might be just a stunning breakthrough. Uh, to, to, to a first approximation, uh, uh, modulation in the brain is done by neuromodulators, which are you know, drugs. They're, 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 uh, uh, particular molecules that are, are received on, on, by receptors on neurons, and they're doing the basic modulation work in the brain, and, and the, the catalog of them is growing, and the understanding of what kind of effects they have is growing. So uh, it's now possible to uh, do what are basically chemical experiments on the brain. And uh, I think that's going to have a tremendous uh, eye-opening effect on just understanding how the competitions that happen in the brain, how they, how they get executed. What, <laughs> when, when different Neural circuits compete for dominance, as they do, they must. Um, uh, how do they do it? Uh, they get a flood of neuromodulators to sort of fuel them in their, in their activity. Uh, they uh, suppress, dampen down the effects. How, how does... Uh, uh, Focus of attention, which is clearly uh, uh, very important. How does that get moved around chemically? It'll really help to know that. We know something about it, quite a bit. A lot of people know a lot more about it than I do, but uh, that's why I'm trying to catch up with them. I think in some things I've, I've read of yours, you say that consciousness is is kind of an, an illusion of, of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, what? Do, does does wouldn't an illusion mean that that somebody is being fooled, and if so, what is the thing ah, that's being fooled? Glad you asked that question, because no. Hmm. Uh, in fact, 
that's what illusion has tended to mean in the past. But we're living in a new era when at least young people are getting used to the idea of a user illusion, which is what you have on your on your laptop or on your on your smartphone. It's a brilliantly designed metaphorical representation of what's actually happening. And that's what consciousness is. And it, it, it's not that you're the victim of an illusion, you're the beneficiary of an illusion. Thank goodness for this illusion. This is, this is if, you, if you didn't have it, your brain wouldn't be able to control your body as deftly as it does. In the same way that if you didn't have the user illusion on your cell phone, you, you, you couldn't do a tenth, you couldn't do one percent of the things you can do on your phone. You need to have a, an interface that simplifies the tasks. And you need to have things color coded, for instance. And so that's what, that's what color vision is. It's color coding the world so that you can keep track of things when recognized when they're similar and tell the difference between things. And uh, that's why we have color vision. Uh, and it's, that's part of the user illusion. As, as you learn in school, atoms aren't colored. And, you know, atoms aren't red or green or blue or anything like that. Color is a, is a, a sort of an artifactual property generated by the interaction between the photons and the surfaces of objects and the visual system on the other hand. And that creates a, a representational system which is beautifully designed to simplify the world. All those swarms of atoms are turned into colored hard surfaces soft surfaces and that's so the world we live in is in a certain sense an illusion it's what the philosopher wilfred sellers called the manifest image as opposed to the scientific image so when people get hung up on um what they call qualia the, the sort of quality of redness when you see yeah. something red um you think we can just kind of ignore that and, and... no we don't ignore it but we 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 frame it in a way to see that um, the subjective response to the world is roughly what people are talking about when they're talking about qualia, but they make one fundamental mistake. They think that the property of being read is instantiated in their mind as opposed to represented by their mind. It's strange that, well, let me give you an example. If I tell you that um, Lucy wore a beautiful purple gown last night, you just learned about a beautiful purple gown. gown. But of course, Nothing purple happened. <laughs> the word purple happened, and the word purple caused your imagination to uh, create a representation of a purple gown. Was that purple? No. <laughs> it wasn't purple. It was a representation of purple, but it wasn't purple. If you want to see something that's really purple, you go out in the world and you see a purple gown. And even that purple is, to say that it's purple is to say that it has a surface which reliably uh, responds to uh, light rays in, in certain ways and affects normal human eyes in certain ways. That's what it is to be purple. So, um, so you're convinced then that evolution has selected for consciousness because it, it enables our, our brains to process in a, information in a way that you couldn't do with a kind of unconscious computer? No, I wouldn't put it that way. Um, nature has provided all locomoting uh, complex organisms, not bacteria, but 
but uh, you know, uh, frogs and salamanders and reptiles and birds and mammals and us with uh, systems that permit each species to track the things that matter to its well-being. And the trackers of those properties of the world, uh, they can do their work independently of consciousness as human beings regularly understand it. But some organisms don't just have the benefit of having these special purpose trackers that modulate their behavior, but have the extra loop of being able to represent the activity of the trackers themselves, not of the things in the world. So that you can not just notice things, but notice that you're noticing them. And it's that reflective loop that creates the manifest illusion of consciousness. Uh, uh, you can make a very simple device that will uh, uh, identify uh, red crosses on a white background. Uh, it has to have, you know, basically a color video camera at the uh, input end, but after that there's no color involved, it's just uh, analysis of information. But now if you suppose you want the device to not just be able to go into a state when it sees a red, red cross, but know that it's going into that state, then you have to add some further representation and things that can use those representations. So you build up representations and representation users uh, in a, a, a sort of a great uh, dynamic pile. And that's where the consciousness comes in. What's the point then in, in that, in being able to do that kind of reflexive um, uh, thinking about what you're thinking about? Well, it keeps you from being deceived all the time. The, the world is cruel. There's an arms race going on, and your let's just take vision. Your your eyes are magnificently designed, but your eyes can fool you. I mean, there are th such things as visual illusions, and you don't want to go running off a cliff because of some visual illusion. So you want to be able to go into a state which says, "Hang on, is the world the way it seems to me?" And as soon as you've got the capacity to check your action and not just plunge ahead, you've got not just subjectivity, but subjectivity that, that you can attend to, that you can concentrate on. Uh, you know, um, um, an earthworm has its subjective take on the world, but I'm pretty sure it can't reflect on that. I don't think an earthworm is capable of thinking, I wonder if this patch of earth I'm burrowing into is quite the way it seems to me. <laughs> I wonder if I'm being fooled here. I, I think, uh, uh, Earthworms are not very wily. Um, if they were, it'd be much harder for birds to pull them out of the soil. Um, so I think the uh, reason that evolution has helped us design um, design our own brains through our own experience, is to make us uh, more able to fend off the various sources of misinformation that we have to confront. How many animals do you think have that capability? 
Well, here I, I maintain a, a, an embattled outpost because I think that human consciousness is roughly as different from animal consciousness as language is from birdsong. Birdsong's a communicative medium, but you can't tell lies or write poetry in birdsong. It's, it does not have the representational power of the language. And I don't think that any non-human, non-language using species has the um, the sheer generative versatility of thought, of representation that we human beings have. And I think we routinely over-endow successful, clever species with mental lives that we model on our own. And it's charming, but there's no reason to believe it. I sometimes call this the Beatrix Potter syndrome, uh, where you think of, uh, you know, smart corvids and smart octopuses and smart uh, whales and chimpanzees as basically human beings dressed up in feather suits or uh, furry suits. And no, no, their minds are uh, very good at what they're good at, but they do not have the uh, powers of reflection that are really essential to human consciousness. So you're giving this lecture tonight about uh, autonomy and responsibility. Um, so what are the questions in that realm that, are interested, that you're interested in? Well, I've written several books about free will and lots of articles, and I've grown so frustrated that people mean so many different things by free will. And they're incompatible with each other, and people tend to be very sure that they've got the right definition of free will in mind. I'm, I'm on the edge of wanting just to throw out the concept of free will altogether and say, all right, do you want to say that free will doesn't exist, that it's illusion? It's, that it's an illusion in a negative sense, you know, that it, it, it's a fantasy. We're deluded if we think we have free will. Okay, okay. Have it your way because there are some, if you think you have free will in a contra causal sense, in a way where you think your decision making is entirely insulated from the causal fabric in, the, in which you are situated, then you're wrong. If that's what you think free will is, then that's an illusion, yes. Uh, but why well, think that that's what free will is? I think the big mistake that people are making, and the one I'm going to try to uh, elucidate today, is people confuse control with causation. People tend to think, well, if the world is determined, if the world is deterministic, then everything that happens is controlled by those causes. No, that's not what control is. If the world is determined, some things are controlled by other things, some things are controlled by themselves, and most things aren't controlled at all. The leaves falling off a tree in the autumn are blown by the wind. They're not controlled by the wind. They're not controlled by anything. That's free fall. That's uncontrolled motion. And if you have a drone and you turn off your console, the controller, then the drone becomes uncontrolled and it'll be pushed around by the wind and fall where it falls. Uh, it, the fact that it's still being caused to move is completely distinct from the question of whether it's being controlled. Control requires feedback. It requires there to be an agent that can adjust the activities of the entity in question uh, 
in order you can drive it into the state that you want it driven into by doing something. That's control. That's what a that's what a puppeteer has over the puppet. That's what uh, a remote controller on your television set does. It controls what channel is on. That's control. Uh, but but that's not just causation. It's causation with feedback guidance and with uh, a, a an intended purpose. So uh, organisms are some of them locomoting ones are pretty much out of control. They don't have much control of their of where they go. Um, uh, uh, plankton and uh, 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 jellyfish, uh, but uh, uh, a shark, on the other hand, is a is a really autonomous controller of its own behavior, and it's not being controlled by anything else. It's being controlled by itself. Well, we are the we human beings are autonomous in a very strong sense. Uh, and that autonomy is our capacity for free will in the sense that we can become, or not always, but we can become and maintain ourselves as moral agents, that, that is, autonomous agents that are responsible for what they do. I'm going to try to bring that out by by looking briefly at things like autonomous cars and autonomous drones. And the first thing you realize about an autonomous car, self-driving car, is you don't want to make it too autonomous. You don't want it to say, no, I don't want to go to London. I'd rather go to Edinburgh. Now that's autonomy. You don't want that kind of autonomy in your, in your autonomous car. You want to have limited autonomy. You want to maintain control over the partially self-controlled entity. Why? Because autonomy is dangerous. If we're autonomous agents, what that means is that we're not under the control of other agents. We're under control of ourselves. Well, how do we dare let such dangerous entities roam around in the earth. We um, tried to give them the sort of moral education to turn them into not just self-controlled agents, but well self-controlled agents. Agents that will protect their own autonomy and not be uh, turned into puppets by other agents, for instance. And so, free will is not part of what you're born with, it's something you achieve and maintain. And you're not responsible for being or becoming a creature with free will. That myth we can set aside, you don't have to be. But you can grow into free will in this sense. So I'm going to come around again to free will in the end and say, um, uh, responsible autonomy, that's free will. That's, that's, that's what free will ought to mean. And it has nothing to do with determinism. When do you think we acquire that, uh, that autonomy as, as moral, uh, morally responsible beings? Well, it's a good question, and the law answers it by one or another arbitrary signpost. Maybe you have to be 18 years old to have a, or 16 to have a driver's license. How old do you have to be to vote? Uh, how old do you have to be to sign a legal contract? Uh, to take out a loan? Uh, to get a, to uh, travel on your own with a passport somewhere? I mean, there's all these questions about when we think that somebody is mature enough and adult enough to be granted full responsibility for their 
for where they go and what they do. Um, the lines have to be drawn for obvious legal reasons. And they are, in some sense, arbitrary, but some lines are better than others. We can have a political argument about whether the, the legal age for drinking or smoking or driving or owning a gun or any of these things, whether that, those should be changed. And we recognize that there are some 13-year-olds well, that are so perfectly mature. They would do just fine as a responsible adult, but they're exceptional, so they still are not granted full moral responsibility until they reach one of those thresholds. And we know people who are 30 and 40 who are still basically children, uh, not capable of responsible self-control, not they don't respond to reasons the way they should. And what do we do with them? That's where all of the moral and legal problems come. At what point do we intervene and say, uh, sorry, you're, you're, you're not a responsible agent. You don't have free will. Uh, your signature on a contract doesn't count. It's a, it's a tough lesson for people to swallow when sometimes it has to be uh, uh, when it has to be administered to them. Uh, so there's no bell that rings. There's no joint at which nature carves responsibility. That's a that's a a political decision that we have to make. I'm are you worried that uh, we'll create machines that have too much uh, autonomy, that will kind of lose control of them, or we'll put too much trust in, in them? I am. I'm worried. Well, I'm worried mainly about our putting too much trust in machines that don't deserve, uh, that, that, that don't deserve the authority that we grant them. And this is going to happen independently of whether they're... They aren't going to be moral agents, they're just going to be smart tools. But they're going to be such smart tools that the most responsible users of those tools will feel obliged to accede to their judgment. This is already happening in medicine. Uh, diagnostic machines are now better than the physicians that use them in some instances. And the physicians are going to have to learn that their judgment, however sage and experienced, is really not up to the judgment of the machine. But that doesn't mean that the machine is a moral agent. It just means that the machine is a, is a sort of an oracle. It's a box from which truths emerge with high reliability. And the agents will be responsible for making sure that the machine is working properly and that they understand what the machine's limits are. Then they, moral agents, can be responsible for the decisions that they make uh, with these prosthetic devices aiding them. So in the UK and some other countries recently, there's been this movement led by um, school children um, to kind of do something about climate change and get the grown-ups to uh -huh. act responsibly, which um, seem, seems quite impressive. Do you think that, um, that, uh, that we should be putting more, or talk more decisions, more responsibility in the hands of, of children? And do you think that, 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 um, that they can kind of give us hope that we'll do something about climate change? I think we should be open-minded and listen very carefully to what the children say. But I don't think we should uh, grant them full uh, moral adulthood yet. I mean, if we did, that would mean they get the vote and they pay taxes and a number of other things that are part of being an adult. And I, I don't think 
that they're ready for that. And I think they would be exploited. And uh, so, by all means, let's uh, allow for the very real possibility that, that they've got some things right and it's their future that they're talking about. Uh, we'll be gone, but they'll be still here and they've got to deal with it. But at the same time, uh, let's remember that they're children and they're not fully developed and there's plenty of scientific grounds for saying that young children are impressionable, gullible, uh, easily, uh, easily misled. Uh, not that adults aren't fairly easily misled, yes. but there's a difference. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.